You're listening to After Images, a podcast for cinephiles that takes a deep dive into moving images. Each episode features a special guest who is invited to explore a film of their choice. After Images is hosted by film writers Franck Bouleg and Marisa C. Hayes. For today's episode, we are joined by Matt Sollerseitz to discuss the Alien franchise. These genre-crossing films have left an indelible mark on the history of cinema, beginning with Ridley Scott's 1979 entry, Alien. Starring Sigourney Weaver as Ellen Ripley, Alien depicts an unassuming space cargo vessel that encounters a mysterious xenomorph, whose appetite for violence quickly diminishes the crew, leaving Ripley and her cat Jonesy as the sole survivors. The success of the film led to multiple sequels directed by a diverse group of filmmakers. Aliens 1986, directed by James Cameron. Alien 3, 1992, directed by David Fincher. An Alien Resurrection, 1997, directed by Jean-Pierre Jeunet. Scott also directed a prequel series composed of Prometheus, 2012, and Alien Covenant, 2017. Mazzola Sides is the editor at large of RobertEbert.com. He is also a staff writer for New York Magazine and Vulture.com, and a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Criticism. His books on TV and film include The Wes Anderson Collection, The Sopranos Sessions, and Mad Men Carousel. Matt zoller welcome to After Images. We're so delighted to have you here with us today for our seventh episode. Happy to be here, and I'm happy to be lucky number seven. <laughs> <laughs> and you suggested discussing the Alien franchise today, which kicked off in 1979 with Ridley Scott's first installment, Alien. Um, can you tell us first, why did you suggest the Alien franchise, and what does it mean to you? Well, it's just an endlessly fascinating uh, series of movies, and and I I consider I don't believe there's ever been a bad Alien film. There's only been good and great, and and uh, I don't consider the Alien versus Predator movies to be canonically Alien films. They're more kind of co corporate synergy, uh, but even those have their moments, I think. And uh, but the Alien films, uh, the, to me, I define the franchise as. Alien, which was 1979, Aliens, 1986, Alien 3 or Alien Cubed, uh, 1992, uh, Alien Resurrection, 1997. And then we got a very long gap without an original Alien film until we get Prometheus and then Alien Covenant, both by Ridley Scott. And of course, there were a lot of ancillary products that were produced that are kind of related and some of them are better than others. But to me, it's the films that are that are really the the heart of it the kind of biomechanical black chrome slimy heart of it you know and how has your uh, relationship with the franchise evolved in, uh, through time um uh, with uh, each film well alien was probably the first piece of adult science fiction that i ever became obsessed with like by adult i mean things that are really not for children not just because of you know the violence and disturbing imagery and all of that, but but also it's just not it's confusing for a child to see something like the original Alien, and I think it's still confusing, even now, decades later, after so many of the famous images and and situations from the Alien films have been co-opted or just straight ripped off by countless countless television shows and films. Uh, and uh, to the point where I bet you the people who are doing it probably a lot of times don't even realize what they're ripping off. They're ripping off something that ripped off something that ripped off an alien movie. Mm. Uh, that's that's where we're at now. Like it's become part of the cultural DNA. And and um, I was a kid. Oh, God, I was, I guess, 10 when it came out. I was too young to get into the film. It was rated a, a R. No one under 17 admitted without parent or guardian. Um, my mother and stepfather went to see it in a theater and they were raving about it, but they they said it was too 
too old for me. It was too mm. mature. Mm. Uh, but I remember my stepfather describing it to me and saying, um, I was I was fascinated by how bloody it was, by how gory it was. And he said, you know, the funny thing is, I don't think it's really actually that violent. He said, you you see you see little glimpses of things, but you don't see as much as you think you do. Hmm. Which I thought was an interesting way of describing it, considering that it was the 70s and graphic violence was really sort of entering the mainstream in the late 60s and early 70s. But, you know, even somebody who was not, you know, he was more sophisticated a moviegoer than a lot of people, but he wasn't a super, super sophisticated, like analytically minded film goer. But even he knew that there was uh something happening with implication in that movie um and i i consumed the graphic novel we, well we called it a comic back then but there was a comic book version of alien uh and uh, they carried it in the book section of a department store not too far from my house and when i used to go with my grandmother to this department store the whole summer and fall of 79 i would go over to the book section to just endlessly reread the alien book because i wasn't allowed to see the film by my my, my family so I knew everything that happened in it, and I actually bought the alien bubblegum cards. They were trading cards of alien that you could buy at the supermarket, and I bought them. And they had pictures of like the chest burster coming out of John Hurt and, you know, all kinds of just horrendous stuff. And you could just buy it along with a with a Hershey bar at the at the mm -hmm. checkout counter. It was the 70s were weird in that way. Um, <laughs> and then uh, the second film came out when I was in high school. Um, and I had been a fan of the Terminator and I was a big fan of a lot of other movies that were, I think, sort of in this vein, like uh, the remake of The Thing and Blade Runner. Um, uh, but I was completely taken with Aliens and I've been uh, really gung ho about pretty much all of them ever since. I think and, and the thing to me that makes them so special is they're all different. Hmm. They're not endlessly trying to sort of tweak the formula of a successful franchise. And, and there are certain elements that recur in pretty much every alien film. There's the initial uh, mission slash distress, you know, distress signal that turns out to be a warning or a corporate uh, order to go to a certain planet. But there's something they haven't been told, hmm. like the fact that they're all going to die. That's hmm. usually what it comes down to. And then there's the uncovering of the treachery and finding out that the real enemy is not the xenomorphs, but the humans who are exploiting other humans in order to make money off of the xenomorphs or use them use them for corporate purposes or military purposes or something like that. Like the xenomorphs are kind of a means to an end there. Uh, like zombies in a zombie film. Like the zombies are not evil in a zombie film. Hmm. They're just zombies. You know, it's a like the, it's the evil that is revealed is what the humans who are not infected do. And it's the same thing with the alien films. And uh, I'm I'm endlessly impressed by the ability of these filmmakers to make something different uh, each time. Like like I, I love Alien Resurrection, like that's considered generally to be the least of the four, mm -hmm. uh, the first four. But I love it. And I love it that it's, you know, it's got this very French sensibility and you can really see how Jeunet and Caro took from uh, from Ridley Scott, mm -hmm. you know, originally, like a lot of that aesthetic. I think it's Ridley Scott plus, plus Terry Gilliam plus Orson Welles is about 90 mm percent -hmm. of their aesthetic. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was watching it on cable the other day and I was laughing because the you know the, the the they've got Dominique Pignon and and you know the and and the look of it it almost looks like city at lost city of lost children at certain mm -hmm. points and, yes, yes. and and it's basically it's a pirate movie they've mm -hmm. made a pirate movie and they've and they've somehow added Frankenstein like the original Frankenstein to it mm -hmm. um and so you know the first one is a haunted house film uh, crossed with a slasher film and I don't think it's a coincidence that it came out, you know, four years after Jaws and one year after the original Halloween, because it's basically Jaws plus Halloween plus Star Wars, the original mm -hmm. Alien. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the sequel is a war movie. And then the third one, Alien 3, is a prison film. Mm -hmm. It's a prison, basically a prison film. And then the fourth one is, is a pirate pirate picture, you know, mm -hmm. like Frankenstein plus a pirate picture. And then you get to Prometheus, and it's this all it's kind of its own thing, but it's also sort of a, re, a return to the original alien, but it stirs in all of this chariots of the gods, uh panspermia kind of you know seeding of the universe stuff mm -hmm. that 
you used to read in paperback books that were sold again at supermarkets yes. in the seventies. Like my mother owned a copy of the of uh, Chariots of the Gods, right? Yeah, ancient alien. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then and then Alien Covenant, which comes after that, I, I think builds on that in a really interesting way. And it and there, uh, one of the major influences I think is like uh, Bride of Frankenstein. Bride of Frank there seems to be a lot of Bride of Frankenstein and just the the tone of that movie and and it has you know one of the all-time great scenes in science fiction which is Michael Fassbender enacting you know perhaps the fantasy of every actor deep down which is to is to seduce himself mm. he actually gets to seduce himself in that movie that's a, just a wonderful wonderful scene um yeah so yeah I mean I love all of them I could just you know <laughs> There's if some... there hadn't been so many other great, if there hadn't been so many great books written about alien, I could easily write a write another one. You know, mm -hmm. I just I adore them, adore them. There's so much great stuff to dive into, just in terms of what you've just mentioned. But I wanted to return just briefly to what you mentioned about the different directors working in the franchise. We were just discussing this, and the fact that it really struck me that every single director in this series, and I mean, it's, there are quite a few high profile directors that we all know today whose work we appreciate. Every single one of them seems to have really held on to their artistic voice. I mean, it's so recognizable, the themes and the aesthetics that each one is interested in in each film, and they really were able to invest themselves in these films. There is a coherency, and at the same time, each one is so strikingly different based on the director's personal voice. And I'm just wondering, do you have in do you have in mind any other franchises that have really done that? Because for me, Alien seems unique from that point of view. I would say it is unique, probably. I can't think of another I can't think of another example of a franchise that was made at that level, at that budget level, mm -hmm. at that, you know, where it's big enough in terms of financing and cultural clout that you sort of have to be aware that there's a new one mm -hmm. uh, where every film in the series had its own unique uh, flavor. Mm -hmm. And again, there are, like I said, there are certain beats that are, that are ritualized that we expect to see in all of them. Uh, and, you know, the, the James Bond films are the, are the comparison that I always reach for. There are certain things that happen in every James Bond film. And uh, most pop songs have uh, have uh, yeah, a three chord structure, and and you know, used to be there was a there was a little interesting middle eight that switched things up, and I think they've done away with that now for the most part. But it's not about what's the same; it's about what's different. And though, and and I think the Alien films feel different from each other in a way that is that is unique. I mean, even the Star Wars films don't feel as different from each other as the Alien films. And when you look at what happened when we got a, a, a canonical Star Wars film that was different, which was The Last Jedi, uh, people are still mad about that. They're still mad about it. And, and you know, that's why I think, uh, in my opinion, horror as practiced at the at the commercial filmmaking level is superior, is intellectually and philosophically superior to all but a handful of science fiction because horror has integrity still. You know, you don't you go to a horror film and you know that you're going to get the film, you're going to get the style that is correct for the movie, according to the filmmakers, and you're going to get the story and the ending that is appropriate. And if it's an unhappy ending, there isn't a single alien film that doesn't have basically an unhappy ending. Like, you know, maybe a handful of people, Ripley survives. That's really it. <laughs> Everybody else dies. Planets, you know, pl enti entire communities are wiped out and and you know incinerated and infected and used as incubation chambers and killed and torn apart and everything and like they're horror films that's what happens in a horror film and everyone accepts it and mm. i think that gave i think that gave the filmmakers a certain amount of freedom you know knowing that you go to these movies not expecting a big win mm -hmm. at the end of it um but I, yeah i don't think uh, you know the marvel films are more i think more similar than different the Star Wars films are more similar than different. The James Bond films are more similar than different. There isn't a single James Bond film that is as, holy crap, what did I just see as um, Alien 3? Mm -hmm. People were mad about Alien 3 in the way they were mad about The Last Jedi. Mm -hmm. 
But now people recognize that it's it's you know it's a it's a worthy successor to the first two. Hmm. Definitely. Have you have you read the the William Gibson original script for the uh, third film? Not only have I read it, we carry it at my bookstore, MZS Press. Uh -huh. <laughs> we have an entire alien section at the mm -hmm. store. That 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 should tell you how crazy I am about these movies. But yeah. And what do you think um, of this? Uh, alternate universe that it could have created compared to the franchise. Or maybe just for our listeners to say that this is a script that was written by William Gibson, but that was never made. So the third film is a very different one from the Gibson script. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if we hadn't gotten Alien 3 in the form that that it was eventually made in, we wouldn't have had Alien 4, you know, Alien Resurrection, which I really like. Uh, so, you know, it's a kind of a, what they call a sliding doors scenario. Like, I don't know. I mean, obviously everything would have been different, um, mm. but also things would have been different if, uh, what's his name? Vincent Ward was going to direct Alien 3. Mm. Uh, and there's this, this whole, like, you know, this idea of a wooden planet, mm. you know, a planet, you know, with more primitive technology, everything's made of wood. There's no metal. There's only wood. And, and, uh, the idea was that Ripley was Joan of Arc. And she was warning of dragons. And there's a little bitty, tiny trace element of that in Alien 3. Hmm. But they were going to go all out. Like it was going to be like you were watching a, like a, like a, almost like a fantasy film, I think. And, hmm. and uh, that would have been interesting. Hmm. Um, and uh, there have been a lot of, uh, a lot of alternate takes on films that did get made that might have been just as interesting. Hmm. Might have been just as interesting. I mean, I'm glad that, uh, what's his name, Neil Bl Blomkamp. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that whatever alien movie he made would be uh, worth looking at. Uh, he's a good he's a good director, but I don't like the idea of retroactively sort of just agreeing that certain films in the franchise don't exist. I don't like that. Hmm. I didn't like it in 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 the Halloween films. I like the new Halloween films quite a bit, but I don't like that they kind of erase everything else. Hmm. I know comic books do it all the time, but I don't necessarily think that's a good thing. And one of the reasons why one of my favorite sequels uh, of my adult lifetime is Creed is because Creed acknowledges the existence of every pre-existing Rocky film and incorporates elements of it, including mm. Rocky V, which pretty much everyone agrees is, is terrible. Mm. Mm. Even takes elements from that. He's like saying, yes, it all happened. I embrace all of it. He's going to, as they used to say, you know, he's going to eat all, he's going to eat every part of the Buffalo mm. when, he write, when he writes this script. Right. Mm. Um, yeah, so I, I, I love it. I love it. And I love the design. We haven't even gotten into the design of it, which is just extraordinary. Yeah, yeah. But let's let's maybe talk about that design and these iconic uh, Giger designs and this kind of fraught relationship that Giger had too with 20th Century Fox in terms of how things progressed as the the franchise continued and the fact that he wasn't properly credited for this incredible design that he originated. Well, I mean, my knowledge of the story is that, uh, and a lot of this comes from the recent Alien documentary that was made, but also just reading about it. Uh, this uh, conceptual illustrator named Ron Cobb uh, designed everything in the, for really everything in the first movie, except for the stuff involving the Xenomorph and the planet that the Xenomorph is on. Mm -hmm. And Ridley Scott's uh, decision to go outside and get H.R. Giger was uh, just based on wanting to have something that felt truly alien hmm. and he wanted that inconsistency and and i know that cobb was irritated and other people involved in the production were kind of mystified by this idea that they were going to get a completely different designer to do certain parts of the film but i think that i think it works i think it's i think it was a master stroke and um one of the things that was so appealing to to Ridley Scott and to uh, uh, Dan O'Bannon, the screenwriter, uh, is that there was no uh, there was no allegiance to the way these sorts of designs usually were made. Like like you know it was it was confused. It's like is it a machine or is it organic? Is it a is it a, an existing creature that could live 
on on the plane of existence with the rest of us or is it a demon it looks like it comes from another dimension and also is it male or female there it has aspects of male and female anatomy and it's it also is like uh sexually predatory and exploitive it's it's uh um it's it's like this creature that's designed for rape and murder basically and and it's got all of these things that are you know it's the mouth is phallic but it's also vaginal and the tail is like this you know it's almost like a serrated phallus and and uh you know there's all these different ways that the xenomorph can violate a person or or another creature and you also don't quite understand in the first film uh what is their what is their biology like we don't really quite understand it and i remember as a child being very confused by the sequence of it it's like okay there's an egg and then the egg releases a face hugger and the face hugger impregnates somebody and then this worm thing pops out and then it gestates and it becomes the xenomorph which has arms legs a tail and a banana shaped head mm -hmm. and and i thought that doesn't make any sense but that's actually what makes it so scary is that it doesn't make sense according to our earth rules um and i actually think and as much as i love the movies i do think that the same thing happened with the alien films that happened with the halloween movies and that indeed happens with almost every horror film that is successful enough to 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 make the distributor want to make a sequel which is that a large part of the scariness of the original movie came from not knowing what this thing was and, fee and and having trouble connecting it to any system of of understanding or belief that we already had and then you start to explain things in the second film and each explanation brings it kind of narrows your range of 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 imaginative options a bit more like in the first film i think one of the reasons why the first film was so disturbing was that i think it made men fear rape when they were watching it in a way that women often do when they're watching horror films or, or other kind of genre films. But it's like here, this thing was an equal opportunity violator. It will impregnate any living creature that it can get its hands on, you know, against their will. And, and, you know, that was a kind of a great leveler as a horror film. And then, the, and, and it's also kind of beyond gender. It's beyond sexuality, this creature. You know, even as it traffics in this imagery that makes us think of of sex and and reproduction, um, and uh, then you get to the second film, and now it's uh, it's become heterosexualized. This is about a mother, and the end is a battle between two mothers trying to protect their children. And now we find out that the aliens have a queen. So now we know that there's two genders of aliens. So we've narrowed things a bit. Um, and then the third film, it really concentrates on, you know, kind of Ripley's biological reproductive autonomy. And, and you know, I love what they do with Ripley's character, but I also am aware that by focusing on Ripley and focusing on Ripley as a woman, they have sort of opened up, they've opened up one part of the story, but closed down other parts of it. Like, like it is sort of a very heteronormative movie by the time you get to the fourth one where you've got this hybrid Frankensteinian, it's like half alien, half, you know, half xenomorph, half human going up to Ripley and like it kills its own mother. And then it tries to have Ripley be its, it's a great scene. It's absolutely true. Like one of the very best scenes in any of the films, the final 10 minutes of Alien Resurrection. But it's also very much like, it's about mothers and children, children and mothers, mothers and children. It's, and I, again, I don't think that that necessarily makes these not great films. I think they are. I'm just saying there there are other ways the series could have gone. Just like Halloween could have gone in other directions without having it be like, oh, Michael is really her 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 brother. You know, like as soon as you start to explain these creatures, these forces of evil, they become less scary and less interesting, in my opinion. Like it's better to stick to your guns and just say there is no explanation. Mm -hmm. You'll never know. That's scary. Is he, you know, what what is this? What am I looking at? The answer is you don't know and you'll never really know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, all these reflections about um, gestation and motherhood are very interesting um, in the context of a film that takes place in outer space. Because uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I relate this to the notion of Mother Earth, of uh, the Earth as the cradle of life. And um, what I find striking is how scary space 
is in all of those movies. Contrary to space, uh, as described in the films before uh, the first Alien, that were all about the magnificent aspects of space. I'm thinking here of 2001 and Space Odyssey. It is mythological uh, space. It's beautiful. It's uh, superhuman. But then all of a all of all of a sudden, it becomes something extremely scary that is inhabited by beings, demons that are ready to rip you uh, into pieces. Um, mm -hmm. And the notion of continuing to transmit life in a Darwinian environment that is not designed for uh, life as we know it on Earth uh, really uh, brings us back to what we are as biological beings, doesn't it? I agree with that. And I, and I actually would say of 2001, uh, I think that Alien is is probably the first science fiction since 2001 to capture the feeling of how exposed you are when you're in space. And I remember uh, the first, it was the first film I'd ever seen where that made me aware of the fact that one puncture of a spacesuit would kill you and that oxygen runs out. And, uh, and that scene where he has to get, go back onto the Discovery without his helmet uh, very, very frightening even now. And Alien recaptures that. Alien recaptures that feeling of being exposed, uh, physically exposed, emotionally exposed, and, and also just lonely. Hmm. The incredible loneliness of space comes through in that movie. And when they're down on the planet, I remember thinking, you know, that howling wind that never stops. It's like there's the most intense thunderstorm you've ever seen, and it's happening all the time on that planet. Hmm. Hmm. So you can't catch a break. Like even if your equipment is functioning properly at all times, it's still really, really hard just to walk hmm. on that planet. And and uh, when uh, Kane gets uh, hit by the face hugger uh, and it clamps onto his face, um, you know he can't do anything after that. He's 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 basically stuck. Like they've got to, you know, they you've got to extract somebody when that happens. Like it really just, it's like a wilderness film almost, that part of the movie. Mm -hmm. And then when they're back on the ship, same thing kind of in a different way, I think. But yeah. um, in 2001, um, there is indeed this feeling that you're very exposed when you're in space, but there is a, cer a certain majesty to it which I think you don't really feel uh, in the Alien saga, in the mm. Alien franchise. I mean, everything is scary there. Uh, there is no beauty um, or, or not the same sort of um, godlike beauty that you find in 2001. I don't know if no. you agree with this. No, I, I agree with that. And, and I think part of that is... Um... How to say this? I mean, I think there's some there's a class perspective that 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 helps define that difference. Like in 2001, these are the elite who are going to space. They're part of a space program. They've been selected by their government and probably trained at the best facilities in existence. And like the mere fact that you're in space in that movie means that you have money or connections. I think that comes through in 2001. There's no equivalent of coach mm -hmm. class. In, in in space travel in 2001. There's only first class. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Alien, it's more like, you know, uh, I can't remember if it was the first film or the second film where the filmmaker described them as truckers in space. I feel like it was the second one. Mm -hmm. But that's what they are. They're like they're 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 truck drivers. They're 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 you know uh, you would say uh, you would call them union guys. Except in the United States, truckers are all Republicans and they don't want unions. So, <laughs> but it's that kind of it's blue collar. It's a blue. It's a working class mentality, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of how much money they actually make. And so they're not in it for the beauty. They're like they're bringing some ore from point A to point B and. And probably I would imagine that having the ability to travel like that kind of drives home the fact that the earth is pretty unique for being pretty and livable. Probably most of the planets are more like the one where they discovered the xenomorph. <laughs> you know, like you're not, not a vacation spot. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a somber, desolate place. Um, I was thinking about the very kind of dark aesthetics, at least in the first few films. Um, in my mind, I had always kind of related them in a way, even though these are vastly different films, to Brazil 
and also to Blade Runner in terms of a very dark color palette and really this kind of unknown, almost noir space aspect where things can come out of the shadows and things aren't familiar and take on different forms. Um, I'm just wondering what you think about this aesthetic at the time and how it relates to to other science fiction works. I think it's I think it's a continu I think it's all a continuum. Like I think uh, what you're saying is absolutely correct about the aesthetic of it. But I also think about how the the aesthetic of the original Alien and of Ridley Scott and of H.R. Giger was inspired partly by um, universal horror films of the 30s and German Expressionism, which was a huge influence on those universal horror films of the 30s. And one thing that I think Ridley Scott really understood about those, and this is somebody who knows his film history, is that in those great black and white horror films, there was more black in the film than there was white. There was more negative space. There was like, they, they used darkness really strategically. And you might see a few, you know, one person and a few elements in the frame might be lit and everything else was this kind of spooky, mysterious, dark space. And that's very unsettling. And, and I think the alien films, all of them really understand this. They understand that they understand that uh, part of what makes a horror film scary is that you're looking around the frame, trying to figure out if there's a threat there, or or uh, you know, or uh, it's not just about the thing jumping out and attacking somebody. It's the waiting, hmm. and it's the and and you know the the first Alien. One thing that I think it it really uh, understood, and I don't know that any of the other films quite recaptured it was. A lot of the really great horror films, there are parts of it that are a little boring, a little boring. And I think I think the great horror films have to be just a little bit boring in certain places because that's the only way to lull you uh, into complacency so they can scare the crap out of you. Mm -hmm. Like, I think The Shining is kind of boring sometimes, mm -hmm. but strategically so. Like, I, I don't think that would the film would be so effective if it were just moving along lickety split and just feeding you plot all the time. Hmm. You know, you gotta have some moments where you're just endlessly following the kid around on the on the big wheel. Hmm. You know, if he doesn't drive endlessly, 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 when he sees the twins, it wouldn't be such a shock. Hmm. Hmm. You know, you have to be like to the point of, really, we're still riding on this big wheel? What the, hmm. and then the girls appear, ah, you know. The, the use of time and timing is so important in horror films. I totally agree. But, but I, I wanted also to uh, react to what you said about um, the way that the evil is kept in the dark. Uh, my, my feeling is that, and I agree with what you said earlier on, that uh, to a certain extent, the alien itself is just something that is there on the screen to hide the true evil, which stays in the dark, and that is the company. That is well, way, way, Wayland Utany. Um, and it's interesting to see that um, what we see on the screen itself is not the scariest part of the of the script, is it? No, it's not. It's not. And you know, I did years and years ago, I did a a list of the greatest movies ever made about work. And the number one was Alien, the first Alien. That was my number one. Uh, and I do think that's the great, I think it's the greatest movie ever made in this country about labor hmm. because it's not about an, any individual industry or action. It's about a basic principles of labor and management and the fact that the company, you know, to quote something that uh, 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 an older colleague told me when I was first starting out in, in journalism, uh, an editor that I really liked and was friends with had been laid off by the, by the new, the new boss mainly because they just didn't get along. It wasn't anything to do with her competency. It was just a personality clash. And I was so upset by this. It seemed so unjust that you could fire somebody just because you don't like them that much. Um, and this guy told me, Matt, he said, you've, you've only been doing this for a couple of years and I've been doing this for a very long time. And I'm just going to tell you, you may, uh, your colleagues may love you, and your bosses may even love you, but the company itself will never love you. And, I ca and I've carried that around with me all of my days ever since then. And I think Alien illustrates it beautifully. The company will never love these people. It doesn't love, not only does it not love the people that it's going to sacrifice to bring the xenomorph back, 
for research and study and God knows whatever else they're going to do with it. Um, they, they don't, they don't love, you know, their robot on the inside, Ash, they'll dispose of him too. You know, they'll dispose of Carter Burke in Aliens. Everybody who's on that ship that arrives at the end of Alien 3, uh, except for the actual owner, could be killed. No one would think twice about it. And you know this the the absolute ruthlessness of of capital in the alien films is 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 unusual. Like, and you know, and you also you don't see like sometimes in these sorts of movies there will be like, well, there's this one boss who's actually a, a good person. Mm -hmm. They don't do that in these mm -hmm. movies. Mm -hmm. You know, the people sitting around that boardroom table and at the beginning of Aliens when they're accounting for the adjusted dollar value of the ship that Ripley had to blow up to kill the alien. Mm -hmm. There's not a single person around that table who's sympathetic to her. They don't they don't care. They don't care what she's been through. They don't care that she's been in hypersleep for 57 years and all of her coworkers were were killed by the company. Hmm. Yeah. That's that's the mind-blowing part. By the company. From, from, from the this company killed those people. <laughs> from, from this perspective, the um... The script written, uh, written by Gibson was interesting because it was um, uh, opposing uh, the, uh, the company to another um, group of uh, people in space who were basically communist, uh, but both were as horrible uh, um, and, and both uh, had a total um, disdain for the people themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I think um, the the sort of inability of any of any system of government or or economics that we currently have uh to deal with the problems of life is also a subject of those films mm -hmm. you know those movies you really is there's just predators and prey in those movies mm -hmm. and and there are people who think they're predators who actually are prey they just haven't figured it out yet mm -hmm. um and uh the characters who ally themselves with the predators like Carter Burke end up as prey. It feels almost prescient like the Amazon of space cargo and the <laughs> 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 really because even though I know things were likely already quite bad at that point in time I'm not sure if anyone could have realized the real takeover of enormous corporations that we have today where people aren't even allowed to organize and, and unionize. No, and, and you know, I think there were intimations of it. I think about um, the speech that Ned Beatty gives in Network, you know, how there's there's only, there there are no, there are no country, there are no governments, there are no nations. Uh, there's only, and I can't, I'll never quote it correctly because it's a sentence that's like 90 seconds long, but like mm -hmm. there's only the dominion of dollars. Mm -hmm. Money and money, money trumps everything. Money, money, money destroys everything. It it supersedes everything, and uh, I think they knew. And I think like the fact that like there's a Mel Brooks movie. I think it's High Anxiety, where there's a company called Engulf and Devour, which was you know a joke on Paramount being bought by the Gulf Plus Western company. Engulf mm -hmm. and Devour. Um, but now, you know, that mergers like that seem very tiny compared to what happens these days. The fact that Disney could buy 20th Century Fox is just astounding. It mm -hmm. would have been astounding back in the 70s, but now it's like one, it's like Godzilla swallowing Megalon. Like you can't even believe the scale of what's happening in front of you. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. Yeah. We live in the era of Kaiju Ega. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, uh, we've been discussing lately um, the, the arrival of artificial intelligence in our lives. Uh, and this is also something that is at the core of uh, the Alien franchise. Uh, well, what is your take on this, on the androids, and um, the, the fact that one of them ends up being the most human of everyone in the series to a certain extent? while the other david is probably uh an archetype for uh satan or something like this yeah yeah it does seem that way yeah ash is ash is uh i don't even know if i can really level uh 
value judgments like moral judgments on them i mean maybe i can i guess if they're artificially intelligent and they have real intelligence if the artificial intelligence is intelligence and then they have uh autonomy and they have free will then i guess they can make moral choices and then i can say that ash is despicable you know i mean he's doing you know i guess he's doing what he was programmed to do but he sure seems to enjoy it to kind of an unseemly degree um and bishop yeah bishops is basically a saint hmm. um and uh he gets kind of immolated at the end of it like you know and um Winona Ryder's character in Alien Resurrection, I think, is really complicated and interesting. And there are as I guess there's as many different flavors of of artificially intelligent create uh android in the alien films as there are people. Like there no two are alike, and I think that's great. Hmm. And I like the fact that the David, you know, the two manifestations of David are different. Hmm. Hmm. Um but you know it's <laughs> one thought that i had recently was i was watching um i guess it was when i was watching alien resurrection and i was thinking you know all of these images of robots also the new jendy tartakovsky show uh unicorn warriors eternal they have this steampunk looking robot in it and i was looking at that one and i was looking at winona Ryder in alien resurrection and i was thinking um it's so it seems so quaint this idea that that you know we we originally pictured artificial intelligence as humans like they look like humans they look like us and part of the part of the part of the uh intrigue and the excitement and the horror of it was that you know if they look like us and they are artificially intelligent like us aren't they basically people and then if you enslave them and abuse them and everything, isn't it like uh, a crime? Aren't you committing a crime? You know, those those that's where the real meat of it is, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but AI, as we're seeing it unfold now, doesn't have any of that. It's just ones and zeros kind of flying through the air. And uh, I don't think we understand what we're in for yet. I also think that uh, I I don't know I could be wrong, but I'm also like my bullshit detector is is going off as I hear people explain what AI is capable of. It's like not right now. It's not. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, eventually, possibly, but on the other hand, uh, synthesizers were supposed to have rendered uh, real instruments unnecessary. Hmm. And they certainly did cut down on the need for the use of real instruments and in routine things like recording a commercial for a radio hmm. or something like that. You know, or even most films are not scored with real instruments. Uh, they might throw in a handful just for effect. But but uh, there has never been a synthesized, um, what's the word, a simulation of a real instrument that is believable to the ear of a trained listener. Hmm. The only ones that come close are the ones where they've sampled real instruments. Hmm. Strings like synthesized strings do not sound like real strings. They sound like string flavored ear mush. Hmm. And the same thing with, you know, brass, like synthesized versions of brass don't actually sound like brass. They sound hmm. like brass flavored ear mush hmm. and they'll do, but you know, you know, connoisseurs know the difference. Right. And hmm. I think that still connoisseurs will know the difference between writing that's done by an artificially intelligent software program and a person hmm. they'll just be able to know and like in the same way that you can tell if a, if a if a signature on a book is actually written by a person in the room or if it was stamped on by a machine you can tell you don't even need that much training to be able to tell hmm. um what i'm concerned about is uh people get incited into a frenzy really easily. And I think now it's easier than ever before to make it seem as if politicians and public figures are saying things that they didn't say and doing things that they didn't do. That concerns me. I don't know. I don't know what the way forward is from, from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm less concerned about, you know, is AI going to write, you know, be able to write a script to uh, succession then uh, is AI going to be able to make it seem as if uh, Joe Biden 
called for the FBI to confiscate every Republican's guns. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that schools um, of today and of the future will need to do a lot of teaching about um, how to analyze the images that we are presented with and how to be skeptical with everything. Otherwise, uh, there's going to be a lot of problems. Yeah, there is going to be a lot of problems. And I also wonder if no amount of training is going to help solve that to get around those problems, because what you have, you know, <clears throat> when body cams became became started to become more popular and widespread, uh, a lot of people were predicting or at least hoping that uh, having a video recording footage of what police officers do would greatly reduce the ability of police to say that something was not police brutality or that a shooting was uh, was justified when it wasn't, things like that. And what we found is that you can look at these videos and you can plainly see what's going on, but people on the other side will argue that it shows something that it does not show or that there's things that happened before or after the tape started running, the recording started running, that change our interpretation of what we're seeing and exonerate the police officer mm -hmm. and so so then that you know that begs the question of if you had a video uh like some kind of microscopic video recording device implanted in the forehead of every adult human on the earth and it was running 24 hours a day seven days a week recording everything automatically would that make people believe that something happened when it actually did happen mm -hmm. probably not we probably find another way to deny the evidence right and when anybody can fabricate a video image or an audio clip uh, and the untrained ear or the untrained eye accepts it as real on first glance, then uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I really, really worry about that. I was thinking that like one possible way around it was to return to analog recording, mm -hmm. like, you know, film, having something that's actually on film mm -hmm. where there's a one negative that you make prints from could actually solve some of these problems and same thing with like returning to magnetic analog tape hmm. you know because you you can you know you can edit that you can futz with it a bit but you can't change the nature of what was recorded on there mm -hmm. but i don't know maybe people would find a way to alter that too you know we're we're pretty smart yeah i don't know <laughs> This is not exactly the same thing, but in a similar vein, I'm reminded of what you said about how the Alien franchise is now part of our DNA. And I'm thinking about how many young audiences who may not have even seen the films recognize the constant tributes or motifs that people have borrowed from this film that are just omnipresent today because they've become, you know, they were iconic and now they've just become this part of our everyday film language almost. Um, wondering what you think about that in terms of our relationship today to Alien and going back to what made that first film so iconic. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's possible to make a movie like that now, because I think our sense of what is a good movie and what is a good horror movie has changed. I think in certain ways, maybe it's been diminished. Um, I see an emphasis, a greater emphasis on uh, jump scares which I find very boring for the most part. Like, you know, a good jump scare can be terrific, but if you've got like 15 of them in a row, it's like, you know, where's the art in that? There is none. It's like someone coming, you know, somebody just jabbing you in the ribs hard at random points while they're in the same room with you. It's like, ouch, yes, you caught me by surprise and that hurt, but where's the art, mm -hmm. you know? The art is in, the art is in really disturbing people like psychologically or philosophically. That's where the art comes in, I think. And like Alien does that. It, the implications of Alien are 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 so disturbing. The implications of it, like the things I was talking about earlier, that like we don't know what this thing is. We can't really understand it by any of the means that we have available as humans. Um, they're sitting there speculating on it, and uh, sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're not. And and also the creatures, like as the series goes on, the creatures keep revealing new aspects. Like I didn't know they could swim. We mm -hmm. find out they can swim. You know, uh, are they smart enough to use a doorknob? Yeah, they use an elevator button in the second one. <laughs> You know, I like that. I like the fact that's actually a great, you, you know, way to set up a cinematic joke. It's like, you know, well, at least they can't do X and then mm -hmm. you cut immediately to them doing X. 
maybe they will write the, the script for the next uh, episode in the franchise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the next Alien film, yeah, the studio boss gets a draft on their desk and they're like, okay, so the main character is a xenomorph. Yeah, the scary humans. <laughs> yeah, great guy. He's a great guy. Great guy. Yeah, has a pet. <laughs> but but they, it's very good care. Care is bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still laughing about you know one of the studio notes for Taxi Driver was that they, they were saying can't, he's so unlikable can't we do anything about this could we give him a dog <laughs> like, yeah yeah Travis yeah. Bickle I'm sure he he would take great care of a dog I'm sure he'd be out there walking it twice a day <laughs> maybe he'd drive around with it in the cab you know well the xenomorph is nice to Jonesy the cat <laughs> see <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, and it's so fatal. I, I I just love the fact that these movies are so like they 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 crush. They just extinguish every shred of hope that you have. Like at the end of the first one, she makes it out with her cat, yes. and then and then uh, you know, the second one, uh, she has to leave the cat behind to go off and you know, battle aliens again on the same planet. On the same planet where she met them the first time she can't win for losing and then the third you know and then she gets out of there with you know a, an adoptive uh you, you know basically daughter and and yeah. a possible uh possible boyfriend uh and a and a best buddy who's an android and they all get killed in the credit <laughs> in the credits i think you know a lot of people hate that they they people were so mad about that when it came out a lot of people are still mad but to me that's the ultimate alien plot twist I, I, I applaud it. I don't think anything is bleaker than the beginning of Alien Three, where it's like, yeah, remember all those people you like from the first one? They're dead. <laughs> <laughs> like but that's I, what alien. That's what an alien movie would do. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it, it really functions well with what you were saying concerning jumps, jump scares. That would be just the surface of the mm -hmm. fear. But I mean, here we're uh, uh, dealing with Lovecraftian horror. Uh, that is so much deeper and that is uh, existential in its nature. Mm. We hit yes. rock bottom. <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. And there's feelings of dread mm. that were that were conjured by the first alien. And I mm. think the first Halloween also did it. And uh, the John Carpenter remake of The Thing, I think, did it. Um, and really almost all of the horror films that are worth remembering and talking about have that ability to make to to make you feel dread just kind of a nameless dread like something about the way the scene is shot and lit and 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 uh just the whole energy of it is what it makes you go oh something horrible could happen at any moment mm -hmm. you know um i was thinking about this movie do you see this movie called uh the invisible man the recent one mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. yes I thought that was great. I thought that was a great, just a great horror movie. Mm -hmm. The way it was directed, and I and I and it had like a shot that I've never seen before, which is, uh, you know, the invisible. The genius of that movie is that it uses negative space so well because you know there's an invisible man in this film, and he could be anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so they'll frame they constantly framing her to the left or the right hand side of the frame. So that you have like three quarters of the frame is basically blank and you're sitting there staring into it going, did that piece of paper just move? Is mm -hmm. the invisible man back there? Mm -hmm. Great. And there's a moment where we realize that he's standing right behind her. This is freaking brilliant. Mm -hmm. She's sitting in a chair across, uh, up at a desk and like you see her in close up and the space over her shoulder is empty, right? And there's a very brief rack focus from her face to the background. And mm -hmm. now the background is in crisp, crisp focus, and it's like they've revealed the invisible man who's not even in the frame. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was going to shriek. I mean, that was so, that was one of the scariest things I saw in a movie that year was mm -hmm. that that rack focus. I was like, oh, he was there the whole time. <laughs> such great subtle tension mm -hmm. but it was interesting yeah, yeah. when you mentioned the thing by john carpenter uh, uh, that reminded me of what i think is also a very influential film uh, for the alien franchise and that's john carpenter's dark star i think it of does course. have a, a very strong impact visually and uh, and from the thematic on the thematic level too yes and the story is basically the same 
Hmm. The story is basically the same. It's like the the crew of these basically space truckers. I think probably hmm. it was Dan O'Bannon who came up with this phrase. Uh, they they have the, they bring this alien on board. They and it's called the beach ball. It looks like a it looks like a puffer fish or something, and it kind of bounces around. Hmm. Um, and uh, their attempts to sort of corral this thing that should not be on the ship in the first place is sort of like in a way it's like the seeds of the xenomorph chasing everybody through the, the, the corridors of the Nostromo. Um, but then there's also this other element, which is, you know, do you talk about artificial intelligence is there's they there's a bomb mm. that is artificially intelligent and its purpose, it knows that its purpose is to explode. And it's an extraordinary scene. And I don't believe there's an equivalent to it in any of the alien films. Mm. Maybe I'm forgetting something, but where the last surviving astronaut has to talk, he's trying to talk the bomb out of uh, out of detonating. Isn't that mm. what happens? Yes, yes. Yeah, right. I just love that. It's like Dr. Strangelove level humor for me. Yeah, and they have a, a, a talk about phenomenology and uh, how Descartes would have uh, um, described reality and uh, can the bomb be certain that the world exists? <laughs> yes, 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 it's great. <laughs> just great and like that's really boy you know boy are we in a lot of trouble if we taught <laughs> if we taught the bomb philosophy you know and a great example of how like any any philosophy will be will ultimately be twisted to justify a person doing what they were going to do anyway mm -hmm. you know um and uh yeah but that was a bit that was a that was a big important one and the relationship between carpenter and uh, between the Carpenter Halloween franchise and the Alien films is an interesting one. Mm. And I hadn't quite put it together until you mentioned it, but like the fact that John Carpenter and Dan O'Bannon, who basically created the, the, the gist of Alien, worked together on Dark Star, and then they independently, within a year of each other, make two of the most influential horror films of all time, the original Halloween and the original Alien. And then they kind of get, they set off on their own courses and Halloween becomes its own thing. In fact, three different iterations of Halloween. There've been three distinct franchises. Uh, and then the alien, which is, you know, I think the first four aliens are Ripley's story. And then I think Prometheus and Alien Covenant were attempts to uh, make it more global I mean, or intergalactic, I guess, like, like, it's not one person's story. It's the story of the universe that has these things happening in it. Um, but then there's also uh, Alien versus Predator, which is kind of like a little, you know, like a little kid's fantasy of the monsters fighting. Hmm. Uh, and then you have all of these other comics and, and, and works of fiction. And there's apparently in production, a television show. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, which I, my understanding is that it focuses on the corporation, which I think is interesting. Yeah. Mm. You know, like succession, but with xenomorphs, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, we're supposed to be ruled by reptilians, so. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I, yeah, I had a, I, I, I had a moment where I was at a party with Oliver Stone one time, and I was having a conversation with somebody there, and he called me over, and he, and, and I said, what? And he said, he said, he said, don't talk to that guy. And I said, why not? And he said, he said, because he's a conspiracy theorist. He's completely wacko. <laughs> like, okay, thanks, Oliver. I appreciate it. Call him the ghetto black. <laughs> I mean, I love that. It's like, I've loved that. Like, you know, he's like, yeah, I'm more, I'm telling you, this guy's a bit much, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, listen, we couldn't have a podcast about Alien without asking you what you do think of the Ripley character. And you've just mentioned Halloween. So I've got on a kind of track of thinking about final girls and this really iconic kind of final girl motif that really seems to be getting set up around this time. We've just come from a podcast where we spoke with Harley Payton about Buffy and all these other incredible women in horror today. Tell yeah. us. What did you think of Ripley the first time that you saw the film and how how do you feel about her today? Well, I didn't, you know, it's funny because she was this pioneering character, uh, her and uh, Laurie Strode in Halloween. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think I thought about it at the time. I, you know, because I was, I was in elementary school and I had seen horror films before, but I don't think I had uh, absorbed any ideas that... Uh, 
women and women like the, the the survivor in a horror film is a man i don't think i really had that in my head i'm not claiming that i was enlightened or anything i just don't think i had that that um preconception um but interestingly because i would say because of the success of the of halloween and alien uh we saw a lot more movies that did have a final girl and that kind of became the default yeah hmm. Um, I like the fact that uh, they continued to explore different facets of her personality. Um, it kind of becomes almost like an epic mythological journey after a certain point where, you know, she's just randomly selected to be almost killed or impregnated by this, this creature, the xenomorph that humans have never encountered before. And she survives the attack. Then she has to go back to the planet where she encountered them in the first place and save save as many people as she can from, from them again. And now there's a bunch of them. <clears throat> and then in the third film, and she, and she was in hypersleep for 57 years, and then she's in hypersleep again. And then at the beginning of the three, they take her out of hypersleep. I don't know how much time has passed, but it, it, she keeps thinking she can escape. And, you know, like once she's gone to sleep, it's all over. But they wake her up and it starts all over again. So it's, like it's truly nightmarish. And then even her death doesn't free her from having to, to fight these things. Mm. They they reanimate her from, from her DNA and, uh, uh, you know, pit her against this alien human hybrid, which I, I just love that creature. I love the I love the look of that creature. Apparently, it was more more disturbing until the studio said you got to pull it back a notch. Like there were some like weird external genitalia that were kind of <laughs> male and female that were like very prominently displayed, and the studio was like, "We only have one note, <laughs> which is don't let's not have that." <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, it's fine. But no, we can't have that. We just can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> Before we, we come to the end of this podcast, um, um, is there something you would have liked us to ask about Alien? I can't really think of anything. I, I, I'm just sort of, you know, I, I think it's remarkable that the series maintained as much integrity as it did over the years like there there isn't a single one of those movies that i think is just trash you know that's just that's just kind of piggybacking on on someone else's achievement i think everybody's in there very respectful very respectful of of the original and james cameron even uh kind of evoked ridley scott at certain points with some of the camera moves and compositions and aliens like very respectful like recognizing that this was a classic he was making a sequel to and i think everybody has done that to some extent like uh, there hasn't been the kind of flagrant disrespect that we've seen in like the halloween films for example or you know i think some of the james bond films have been pretty pretty lackluster over the years you know i think there have been more bad james bond films than good ones personally mm -hmm. Um, and I never saw that with the alien movies. I mean, even the even the Rocky films disrespected the original more than the alien films did. And and to me, that's a testament to the quality of the first one. Like the, the fact that like it's almost treated like a sacred object, like let us not disgrace the original alien probably prevented a lot of really bad decisions from being made. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Matt, tell our listeners, how can they find the alien section of your bookshop, which is a wonderful <laughs> online film bookshop with many, many books signed by the authors. So it's a really special place. This is no Amazon. So you need to get yourself <laughs> to the online bookshop. Tell us how we can find it. It's it's the address is mzs.press. That's mzs.press. And it's an online bookstore specializing in the arts. We have a lot of television books, film books, music books books on visual arts, uh, uh, you know, we even have kids books and coloring books, but they're all, they've all got kind of an arts focus. Um, and we have dedicated sections to certain types of entertainment. Like we have a kaiju section, we have an aliens section, um, and you can find those by uh, uh, just doing the pull down menu and going to the uh, science fiction tab. But yeah, we have star, we have star Wars, we have star Trek, we have, we have uh horror we have science fiction we have um crime 
uh, all kinds of things. And a lot of the books are used. Like we want to make sure to include a lot of used books so that people can afford to buy them. Like you can't, most people can't afford to be dropping, you know, $50 on a book every week or so, but, you know, we have some that are as cheap as five, you know, and, and I, uh, my business partner, Judith and I select all the books and they tend to be just things we thought were interesting or cool. Um, that's the only rhyme or reason to them. We don't carry a lot of the books you think we would carry and we carry a ton of books you think we wouldn't. Um, so yeah, that's the, and, and the, I'm quite proud of the alien section and we're actually going to have signed copies of becoming alien by Sarah Welch Larson. We, we used to have those a couple of years ago and we ran out and we've decided to restock and we're actually showing aliens, uh, May 17th at IFC center in New York. Uh, and, and Sarah's going to be there and she's going to talk about her book, becoming alien, which is kind of a theological, uh, philosophical reading of the alien films. Great book, great book, Becoming Alien. Um, yeah, so that's that's my pitch. <laughs> and what's your next publication? What can we look for from you? Well, I've got a book on the French Dispatch finally coming out. It was it was uh, delayed by the Disney merger for a couple of years, and it's finally coming out. And then I have a book on Asteroid City coming out next year. Um, and I'm also working on a couple of other books, which I can't discuss right now because they're not actually officially happening. They're cl I think they're pretty close. Um, but the main thing I'm working on at the moment is uh, the bookstore and also uh, a film about my dad, a jazz musician named Dave Zoller. And uh, I was his manager and patron and uh, producer during the final years of his life and he he made his final album while he was dying of cancer and it's a it's a a, a set of uh, his own arrangements of duke ellington um and we're pretty close to having that cut together and i'm really excited to premiere that at some point you know i don't know if it'll be this year or next year but we're getting pretty close thank you very much Marcelo Sykes, for having taken the time to chat with us about the alien franchise it was uh really amazing to listen to um, you um, chat about the subject because you know it uh, obviously so well. So thank, thank you. you for having spent this time with us. Well, thank you for everything both of you do. I really appreciate it. And, and you know, also for your, for your marvelous books, which we carry at the bookstore. Thank you for listening to After Images. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast app and follow After Images podcast on social media.